Hi, I'm Rachel Erickson He. And I'm Silpa Sarma. And we're here to talk to you about Stanford Business School. I'm a former Stanford, or I'm a Stanford GSB alum and a former Stanford Business School interviewer. And Silpa. And I worked as a file reader for the Stanford GSB for um, a few years. And uh, also I'm a uh, Cornell Johnson alum and we both work for Fortuna Admissions. So the first thing we are going to do today is we're going to kind of give you a little bit of an overview about Stanford. Then we're going to talk about what Stanford is looking for in its students. And then finally, we're going to finish up with some tips on how to actually tackle the application in different parts of the application. Uh, to get started, I think we're going to dive right in and we're gonna talk a little bit about Stanford Business School and how the Stanford culture is unique and who might be a good fit for Stanford. And when I talk about this, one thing that you should know is that change lives, change organizations, change the world is more than just words to Stanford. It's really what they're looking for is people who have the potential to live up to that statement. And this means they want people who have big dreams. Whatever it is that you want to do, you should want to make a difference. And they also want people who are going to use their GSP experience to turn those dreams into reality. That fundamentally is a really core part of the school and what it believes it, its mission is in the world. The next thing that you should know about the Stanford ethos is that it is a smaller school and it has a positive, supportive culture overall. There are approximately 420 students in each class. And this means that you get to know most of the people in your class and that helps create this close knit community. Also, when you look at the individual class sizes, when you're actually in the classroom, it's usually a maximum of about 60 people, which is once again, a fairly comfortable size, a little bit smaller than some business schools. And this allows for you to get to know your classmates and to really have a discussion where everyone can participate and lends itself to that small close knit feeling. Also inside and outside of the classroom, Stanford is very much a collaborative place, not a competitive one. And that is important to emphasize. If you look at classroom discussions, people will voice different opinions, different perspectives. There may be disagreement, but when there is disagreement, it is typically presented in a respectful and constructive way. It's not about winning an argument or showing that someone is wrong. And I think it is important to keep that in mind if you're thinking about attending Stanford Business School, that those are some of the expectations the school has for the classroom behavior. And then also you see there's just tons of group projects and team-based work at Stanford. This is a really important component of the learning and also is a great way for you to get to know your classmates and your peers on a, a variety of different levels. And then the third thing I want to say about Stanford is, of course, the reputation Stanford has for entrepreneurship, for technology, and for venture capital, and its close ties with Silicon Valley, because I want to make it very clear that Stanford is much more than that. I think sometimes people, when they're looking at Stanford, if they're not interested in those things, they need to understand that Stanford is a general business school. It is designed to help people in all areas of management, both in business and even outside of business, in nonprofit or government. Stanford is about helping people with organizations and helping people with organization change, organizational change, in addition to all of the aspects of business that you typically think of. So no matter what it is that you're interested in, Stanford is potentially the perfect school for you. And if you look at GSB students, they reflect that. You have, yes, a lot of people who come from the big three of finance, consulting, and tech, but you also get people who come from the art world, who come from education, who come from healthcare, entertainment, military, real estate, clean tech, incredibly broad variety of industries. And when Stanford is putting together its class, it's very important for them that they do have a wide range of experience because they believe that that is what helps enhance everyone's learning. Now, having said this, the fact that Stanford is in Silicon Valley does affect the school in a couple of different ways. And the first is, if you are someone who wants to pursue entrepreneurship or technology or venture capital, 
there are fantastic opportunities to do that between the professors who work in these industries, the people who come to campus who are alums, the broader Stanford community. It's really easy to make these connections and develop those relationships. But it's much deeper than that, I think, because people even who are not at all interested in those areas take something away from Stanford. And what I think that they take away is Stanford really instills a sense of endless possibility in its students. And so say you go to work at a Fortune 500 company, even though you have nothing to do with entrepreneurship, you are going to have that mindset and that attitude that if what you envision doesn't exist, you have the tools, you have the knowledge, and you can create it, you have those capabilities. And I think that's just a really fantastic thing that Stanford Business School students leave the school with is that mindset and that ethos, no matter what they go on to do later in life. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the actual experience of the school. I'm going to cover a little bit about the academics, what it's like to be a student there. And then I'm also going to talk about the other side, which is the fun part, which is a huge part of business school, the people who are there. Stanford uses a hybrid approach to teaching. So how they teach really depends on the subject matter. If you're taking a course like finance or statistics or economics, they're going to use a quantitative approach. You're going to be taught the underlying principles behind the conclusions. You should be expect a lot. You should expect that there will be a lot of math in some of those courses. But at the same time, Stanford really believes in the case method. And if you look at a class like statistics, for example, you may learn the theory behind regressions, but it, you will also potentially have a case where you see a real world practical example of how to use regressions and how to make a decision about a particular project based on the data from those regressions. And then there are a number of, of classes at Stanford that are 100% case-based. For example, the classic strategy class you take your first year. And those are a great opportunity to really learn from real world examples, to learn from your classmates and to learn from the professor and get those detailed discussions that are so important to business school. And then finally, the third way that Stanford believes in teaching its students is experiential or learning by doing. And a great example of this is there's a class called Design for Extreme Affordability. And in that class, you actually have business school students who pair up with engineering students for a project uh, that is supposed to help people with limited resources. And so one example of something that people did in this class was they created a filter system to remove microbes from water for people who didn't have uh, pure drinking water. And they don't just come up with the idea. They don't just come up with the business plan. They create prototypes and then they even take those prototypes and they go out and they find partners in the real world to bring these products to people who actually need them. And I think this is a fantastic example of some of the opportunities that are available at Stanford, where even as a student, you can really live up to their motto of changing people's lives and making a difference. Um, I do want to emphasize that academically, Stanford is a demanding program. Um, there is a lot of higher level math, as I mentioned, and it is also a heavy workload, particularly during the first year when you're adjusting to things. Uh, the first time you read a case, you don't really know what to look for. The good news is that by the end, the beginning of your second year, you get much faster. You know how to analyze a case. You know how to think about it. You really learn the skills that you need to get through your work more efficiently. But do be prepared that it is a fair amount of work at the beginning. And then I also want to talk a little bit about what you learn at business school, because I think a lot of people go into business school thinking that they are going to learn accounting, they are going to learn marketing, they are going to learn operations, they are going to learn finance. And I think what business school teaches you, or at least in my experience at Stanford, is much broader than that. I think that business school really teaches you how to understand, how to assess and evaluate complex and ambiguous information and data and then to use that complex information and that the, where there may be a lot of uncertainty and doubt and still learn how to make decisions and exercise your judgment. And I think that the skill is something that is not just about business. It's something that when I graduated, I felt I took with me that really applied to everything. And that this way of thinking is something that you will use no matter what you end up doing with your life. And it's one of the two most important things that I feel I learned at Stanford Business School. The second most important thing for me about Stanford Business School was, of course, the people. 
And I want to talk a little bit about the people and the experience because that is just as much a part of the education as in the classroom. Uh, the Stanford campus, if you have not had a chance to see pictures of it, is very much an indoor outdoor campus, which is great. It takes advantage of the gorgeous California weather. You might sit outside at a picnic bench for two hours in a study group and then end up staying there for lunch and then end up staying there for a conversation with your friends about whatever you want to talk about. Stanford is located in Northern California in the Bay Area. So Palo Alto is just a really nice college town. And then if you want a bigger city, you have San Francisco, which is about 45 minutes away and you can go explore the city or go there for a night out. And then finally, the Bay Area is pretty famous for its outdoor activities. There's hiking, there's golf, there's biking, there's a beach, you can even go skiing on the weekends sometimes. And even if you're not somebody who's an outdoors person, it's a lot of fun. It's a great way to meet people. It's a beautiful setting. And it's a really wonderful opportunity to try something new, even if that's something that you uh, wouldn't necessarily do. I know when I was there, I took a tennis class and it was a lot of fun. And then Stanford also does have a lot of social activities. One great example where you really get to know your classmates is uh, on Friday afternoons, they have something called LPF. It's held in the courtyard. Usually there's a student band, they have free beer and sodas, and everybody from the school pretty much just shows up after class and hangs out there for an hour or two. And it's a really great way to get to know your classmates and to develop those friendships. One of the things I do want to emphasize also about those people that you're gonna meet is that there are a lot of different types of people at Stanford. We have athletes in the class. There are writers, there are musicians, there are people who live for golf, there are people who love salsa, there are people who love reading. It's really not one person who goes to Stanford and Stanford is looking for that breadth of type of people, of personality, of interest, experience and passions in their class. And I think though that the one thing they do all have in common is that these people are very excited about the opportunities that the school provides them and they really want to make the most of them. So now I've given you a little bit of a sense of what the experience of Stanford is like and the culture, and I'm going to turn it over to Silpa to introduce us to what Stanford is actually looking for in their students. Thank you, Rachel. So a common question among applicants is about the academic background that the GSB is seeking. So whenever this question is posed to me, I like to remind people that the GSB has a holistic and a comprehensive evaluation approach. So there's no single category, such as academics, that's going to serve as the sole determining factor of an admissions decision. So that being said, as Rachel had mentioned earlier in the presentation, the GSB is a place where students solve complex problems and they explore big ideas from interdisciplinary perspectives in a very collaborative way. So given the nature of that environment, the admissions committee is really seeking to understand how an applicant might engage within the GSB classrooms. They're looking for evidence that an applicant has had interesting ideas, ideas to solve tough problems, or perhaps the applicant has had an idea to do something in a new way that no one's thought of before. So this type of intellectual vitality and intellectual engagement can be found across a wide range of disciplines. A common myth among prospective applicants is that they're at a disadvantage if they don't have an undergrad degree in finance or econ or something quantitative. But the truth is the GSB admits applicants across a wide range of majors and fields of study for the diversity of perspectives that they bring. Fine arts majors, social science majors, STEM, business majors, they're all equally valued for these distinct perspectives that they lend to the class and the environment. And beyond being present in different academic disciplines, the intellectual vitality and curiosity that the GSB seeks in applicants can also show up in many different places in the application, not just by looking at the grades or the test scores. So this can show up in letters of reference in an applicant's supervisors and colleagues' account of their contributions. It can show up in the short answer questions, the types of subjects somebody studied on their transcript. Really strong applicants, they demonstrate this intellectual capability, not just through the academics and the test scores, but also through contributions that highlight these problem-solving skills, these critical thinking skills. 
these these really strong applicants here, they can demonstrate that they not only can manage the rigor of the program and the curriculum, but that they're also willing to expand their mind and share their intellectual curiosity and knowledge base to enhance the experience of their classmates. So as you approach your application, I encourage you to reflect upon the times in which you've learned new things or solve tough problems or shared your knowledge and insights with, other, with others, because that'll be pretty telling on how you would engage within, within the classroom and the environment for GSB. So next, um, professional experience. Um, that's also a common question. What is the right background? What kind of background would you know, poise me well or make me a compelling candidate um, for uh, the class of the GSB? So, Right here, I would say just as there's no such thing as the ideal applicant or the ideal undergraduate major, there's really no such thing as an ideal or even a preferred professional background or industry here. Strong contributions and impacts, they can be seen from folks who are working in a wide range of industries uh, and geographies. Uh, leadership potential can be seen in relatively recent college grads and also in seasoned professionals with 10 plus years of work experience. So whether you're working for a family business or a Fortune 500 or working in education or engineering um, or spent, say, two years working for the government versus, I don't know, 10 years working in consulting, uh, your professional background shouldn't deter you from applying. Because at the core of it, the GSB is looking to build a class with an exceptional ability to lead. And that's why one of the criteria they're assessing is demonstrated leadership potential. And one thing to recognize as an applicant is that you don't need formal leadership experience to demonstrate leadership potential. The admissions committee is going to look at the leadership qualities that an applicant has shown to date through their work history, and they'll assess how these qualities might contribute to that applicant's effectiveness as a leader. Qualities such as self-awareness, um, business partnering skills, uh, helping to develop someone's or someone's skill set at work or an interest in developing other people at work, as well as strategic problem solving and critical thinking skills. And since past performance is believed to be the best indicator of future performance, the admissions committee is basically looking for examples of how you've created positive impact. And they'll be evaluating the leadership skills you have now while also making an assessment on how open you are to learning new leadership skills. They'll want to know what you've contributed and how you're performing, regardless of the level or title that you're, you currently hold. So as an applicant, think about what you've achieved at work. Think about which impacts that you've made that you're particularly proud of, be it from times you've led a team or taken initiative or made meaningful contributions, despite all of the challenges in front of you. And make sure you shine a light on those to really highlight that leadership potential that the GSB is looking for. So next, Rachel is going to talk a bit about the extracurriculars and how to stand out in this regard. Sure. Um, so the extracurriculars are a great chance to distinguish your application and really make it stand out. And in a couple of different ways. The first is it can highlight your interests and your passions and what makes you tick and who you are. The next is it can show your dedication and your commitment and how uh, you're somebody who really follows through on something. And then next, your involvement in the community. And finally, as Silpo talked about, it's a great opportunity to highlight your leadership potential. When I we talk about interests and passions, my advice here is that you should focus on what interests you. Do the things that you actually want to do, not the things that you think are going to look good on an application, because the extracurriculars are really a chance for you to show what you care about. And if you're doing something that you don't actually care about that isn't reflected anywhere else in the application or, or doesn't seem authentic to who you are as a person, it's going to come across, it's not going to be consistent. This doesn't mean that you can't think strategically about what your extracurriculars are going to be if you're somebody who's applying to business school in a couple of years. If you're interested in ed tech, for example, maybe it makes sense to join a tutoring program and become involved with that. But whatever it is that you do should be aligned with who you are and what you care about. And if it's not, my best advice is to find something to do that you actually do care about. 
The next thing that extracurriculars can demonstrate is your dedication and your commitment to something. And here it is much better to have a few extracurriculars that are important to you than to have a lot of different activities with marginal, marginal involvement. It really is about substance. It is not about quantity. It is not a checklist. And I also want to say that it is not worth joining a bunch of activities shortly before you're applying to business school. You're very unlikely to have the time to make a difference and to have any meaningful impact in the organization. And so it's not worth doing. You're better off focusing on things that you already are interested in and you already care about. The next area that uh, extracurriculars can demonstrate is your involvement in the community, because business schools are looking for people who do give back to their community, whether that is in a formal basis or on an informal way. And extracurriculars, some extracurriculars are a fantastic way to demonstrate how you give back. And then finally, leadership potential, which Silpa has talked about, is one of the key things that Stanford is looking for. Extracurriculars can give you an excellent opportunity to de demonstrate this leadership potential because you can often have significant responsibility at a much earlier stage than might be possible professionally. So if you've done something amazing with your extracurricular and that's where you've really shown your star leadership potential, that is definitely something to highlight in the application. A couple of other notes about uh, extracurriculars that I tend to get asked and questions people have. First of all, just to say college extracurriculars do count, especially if it was something that was important to you and where you had a key role. Secondly, not every extracurricular has to be with a formal organization. If you're someone who loves mountain climbing or you spend a lot of time taking care of a neighbor or a family member or you're passionate about filmmaking or photography, these may not be in, as part of a formal organization, but they still count as extracurriculars. They show what it is that you care about what it is that matters to you, who you are as a person. And then finally, extracurriculars can also be work related. Sometimes uh, people are really busy and don't have time to spend every weekend doing something, but they do do a lot of stuff at work and they contribute to the community at work. So they may be involved in recruiting or in affinity groups or mentorship. And this absolutely counts when Stanford is thinking about an extracurricular activity. And now that we've talked a little bit about what Stanford is looking for in those areas, we are going to shift to the application itself and give you some tips on how to present these aspects of, of what you have done. And the first thing I wanna talk about is the Stanford Business School application form and how it is different from other M7 applications. And the important thing to know here is that Stanford has an extremely comprehensive application. They allow you to list up to six jobs, up to six extracurriculars, I believe up to six different awards. And then within that, every single job that you've had within a company, you are allowed, you are supposed to not just mention the job title, but also give a description of your responsibilities in that role. So for example, you may have just had one job, but you've had two different promotions. That's actually three different roles and responsibilities that you're going to need to describe. And on top of that, Stanford gives you 320 characters to describe those responsibilities, which is more than a lot of schools that give you 200 or 250 characters. So you have more room to describe what you've done. My main takeaway here with this is that this is not an application you want to start the night before it is due. It will kill you. It is really important to take the time to do the application well, to do it thoroughly, to take the care to make sure that all of those things that you've done are presented accurately and comprehensively and so that you really put your best foot forward with the admissions committee. The other thing I want to say about the Stanford application, the other piece that's kind of unique that Silpa mentioned a little bit earlier, is Stanford has several short answer questions as part of their application. These are optional, but we think they're a great opportunity to share those accomplishments, to show that leadership potential that you've demonstrated, and to really show what it is that you are proud of that you have done. Uh, the first three, you can give up to three different examples of the impact that you've had in, in the organization. And then the last question is, there's a question about how your background has influenced your behavior in a situation. And these may change in the future. This is this current year's application and Stanford does sometimes tinker with its application. But if they do say the same, I just wanna say these are terrific questions. They give you 
a fantastic opportunity to go into more detail about something on your resume or something your recommender may have mentioned that is really important and give the business school reader a chance to understand it on a deeper level. When you are doing this, there are a couple of things you need to keep in mind to make sure that you present yourself as effectively as possible. The first is this is actually a place where you need to use I, not we. It's not about what your team did. It's about what you did. And so you need to get out of the we mindset and <laughs> transition into the I mindset for a second. The second thing is you need to make it clear why what you did was important and why it mattered. And then you also need to make it clear why what you did stood out and why it was special or unique compared to what someone else in that situation might have done. Because what Stanford is looking for is people who don't just do their job, but people who contribute something special, something different, something unique. And this is really a key part of those questions is making it clear what that is for you. And then the last question, one thing I want to point out about that is when it asks about your background, sometimes people think that that means demographic information. And I want to be clear that it can be demographic information, but it can be really so much more. It's a pretty general question. It can be your upbringing. It can be your interests. It can really be any life experience that has shaped you and then simply explaining how that has influenced your behavior in a work setting. And now Silpa is going to talk about the next part of the application, um, which is the letters of recommendation and the essay. Thank you, Rachel. So letters of reference. Um, candidates or applicants, when they wonder, you know, what constitutes a strong endorsement? Um, so I, I first like to remind them that this is one of the parts of the application that you might not necessarily appreciate the importance of right away. As I've stated earlier, past behavior is seen as being predictive of future behavior. So the admissions committee will be looking to the recommendation letters to understand truly the weight of an applicant's impact and their contributions. And moreover, these letters, they're a unique part of the application because they're the only opportunity to see an applicant from someone else's perspective. So applicants, they're asked to submit two letters of reference for Stanford, one from a current direct supervisor, as well as one from someone else's supervisor. So in the event that you find yourself in a situation in which um, having the direct supervisor write the letter isn't really feasible, for example, if you're self-employed or if you work for a family member, start a new job, or if your direct supervisor happens to just not know that you're applying uh, to business school. In that case, just go with the next best alternative. This can be from um, someone from the board or a client or an indirect supervisor who's really familiar with your work, and they can write um, strong and compelling letters for you as well. So just be sure when choosing your recommenders to choose people who really know your work and can convey very specific examples about your contributions and how you went about making them. Um, not just listing you know, everything you've done, but just to really paint a picture of how you went about making those impacts and the way in which you're doing your work. Give them time, give your recommenders ample time to write detailed and comprehensive letters in which they can include stories and specific examples of your behaviors, of your working style, your personal qualities and your contributions, rather than just offering overly general praise and compliments. Because the truth is, um, you know, as lofty as the praise or um, as many superlatives or favorable adjectives they use, like that's not what would cause a letter to stand out so much as really offering a detailed account and specific examples. So many times applicants will wonder if it's advantageous to get a recommendation from someone with the highest title, like a CEO or a CFO, or from a GSB alum in particular, or a colleague who happens to be an exceptional writer. But the truth is title doesn't matter, alumni status doesn't matter here, and recommenders for whom English is a second language they can still write really strong and really compelling endorsements because what does matter here is whether they're able to convey a detailed and a compelling account of your impact. When you think about what is a, what's a compelling LOR, what's a strong endorsement? So a compelling LOR highlights a really strong trajectory, a steep trajectory and a demonstrated pattern of excellence. This will likely come from someone who has known you well and who's had significant and direct involvement with you within the past few years. 
These are the people who can write thoughtfully about your impact and they can provide detailed anecdotes and examples to support the statements that they're gonna be making and the praise that they're giving you. So while applicants can select references from work or from community or from extracurricular organizations, the strongest ones do tend to come from the workplace. And it's more than okay to have two references from the same organization. Um, so long as they're capable of, you know, highlighting different things and providing different perspectives on your work and your contributions. Just make sure, um, and this is the important part, is to select two people who can best capture your aptitude, your impact, and your personal qualities. And that will help you come up with letters of reference that uh, stand out and that are compelling in the pool. So another piece of the application um, is essays, of course. And this is um, undoubtedly one of the parts that applicants um, stress over the most. Um, as you approach these essays, um, the key thing to keep in mind is to do a lot of self-reflection. Think about what shaped you, what inspires you, what drives you. Reflect on your values, your passions, your experiences, and your goals in order to really communicate your full and complete narrative. The What Matters Most essay, uh, What Matters Most and Why, um, is a very you know, open-ended and ambiguous one. Um, this one really does offer you a space to, con to convey who you are, rather than just focusing on what it is you've accomplished. I don't advise restating your resume here uh, because other parts of your application have already highlighted you know, your academic highlights and your professional accomplishments. And if you use this space to summarize your resume, it simply just leads you to miss this really valuable opportunity to give the committee a view of your authentic self. Showing vulnerability is more than okay here. Um, in fact, uh, you know, really powerful essays demonstrate that self-awareness and that humility, and they shed light on the dimensions that we might not necessarily see in other areas of your application. Things such as your character, your beliefs, your identity, your passions. This essay might provide a view of the choices you've made and how you've moved through the world and how your background has inspired your path and how it might influence or shape your journey going forward. So just remember that the admissions committee won't be evaluating your values here. They're just simply looking to this essay to, more, to learn more about you and your self-awareness, your self-reflection and personal qualities that you bring. So the second essay, the Why Stanford essay, um, similarly, like to write this essay, applicants need to introspect, um, you know, be self-aware, do their research. You can feel free to write whatever it is you'd like about your you know, professional aspirations and goals. The admissions committee recognizes that these might change a bit after you matriculate, but really you should demonstrate that you've spent time thinking about your true north and the impact that you'd like to have. To do this, um, an applicant should be clear about their vision for their career and convey how the GSB experience would help them attain those career goals. So understand and demonstrate why this is the right time for you to pursue an MBA and why Stanford is the best place for you to do that. Share what you aim to learn from the experience, um, the unique perspective that you'd bring to the class, um, how you plan to get involved and how the program would prepare you for the next stage of your career. And one important thing to keep in mind as you craft this essay is that different business schools have different cultures, they have different offerings and opportunities. So copy and, and pasting or harvesting from another school's essay won't really do you any favors here. Um, it's best to just give it some thought and really just write it from scratch. And one tip on reviewing your own essays, um, you can hand your essays to someone who knows you well, a friend or a family member and ask them to read it. Ask if it sounds like you in your authentic voice, because it should. Um, it, they should be able to tell that something that only you uniquely could have written. You can also give them your essay without the question on it and ask them which question, hmm, excuse me, which question they think you answered, just to make sure you're covering, um, covering the prompt. And above all, just remember that the GSB is genuinely interested in who you are and how you'd fit in with the class. So dig deep and use your essays as a medium to demonstrate your unique voice and your authentic character. And you can do that simply by being true to yourself and telling a story that only you can tell. So authenticity, authenticity is what keeps in mind, what to keep in mind here. So um, with that, Rachel and I have given you um, 
a comprehensive overview of the, the whole application of tips, the GSB experience and what that's like. And like, and, and right now we'd like to um, open it to uh, some questions. I see a couple of questions in the chat room already. Um, there, uh, the first question I saw was about the MSX program, which is actually an interesting one um, for people who are not familiar with it. Stanford has the regular MBA program, but the second question, the second program they have is they actually have an MSX program, which is one year. It is for people who are slightly older, um, who are minimum of eight years work experience and sometimes significantly more, but they take uh, a very similar curriculum to the regular Stanford MBA students. And they also have, um, they may even be taking the actual same classes as regular MBA students. And in terms of the differences, the biggest difference is work experience. Uh, MSX people are a little bit older and have are at a different stage in their professional career. And then I would say um, one of the other differences is in terms of what they're interested in doing post business school, that a lot of MBA students are looking for a complete pivot and want to do something very different. Whereas MSX students are often continuing to do something in the same industry, if not at the same company, but they recognize that, and their company can often recognize that they need additional training in order to do it. It is a full-time program where you live on campus, which is pretty special and unique. Uh, and also you can apply to both the MSX program and the Stanford MBA program. It is not an either or. Uh, this just related the question about applying if you're 33 years of age. The MSX program might be a, a good fit for that sort of an applicant. Uh, that's a little bit on the older side for business school, particularly depending on your work experience. And you may be someone who is at a level where you are better suited for the MSX program. And to add to that, I would also include that uh, for the MSX, like one thing that is very important is the career vision. Because it is a shortened program, it's not the full two years. Someone must really know um, entering that program how they're going to make the most of it and how to use that time to prepare for that next phase in your career. So um, no, certainly you shouldn't be deterred by the fact that you're 33 years old or you've worked in a single company for X number of years. Just have a really good idea of what it is you hope to get out of the program and what it is you want to do um, upon graduation from that program to really um, help present a, um, and articulate a compelling career vision and, and plan going forward. I see another question um, about getting an LOR from a current supervisor in a project, or if it'd be okay to get one from a previous su supervisor um, with whom the work has been in greater detail. Um, it's here again. I would like to reiterate that it's a if there is a reason why um, you know you couldn't ask your current supervisor if they don't know you're applying, or if you the duration of the time you'd worked with them you know isn't quite as lengthy. It's okay to ask that pre previous supervisor who might be more privy to your work and the specifics and the ins and outs of it. And um, perhaps you'd had a longer relationship um, in which they've been familiar with your work. That is um, that is more than okay. Um, I would just probably suggest that in the additional information, um, that optional, um, optional statement that you can submit, that you're describing and explaining that why it is you couldn't ask for your um, direct supervisor to write the recommendation instead. Slip, I think the next question is also for you. Sure. Okay, so the question is, how many adcoms evaluate an essay submitted? Because you worked in GSB admissions, I'm curious to get an understanding about the essay review process works. Okay, so um, when you submit your essays, so it is reviewed by, by committee, so an exact number, I can't really put a finger on, but um, it is, you know, it is just more than one person or more than a couple. Um, so really the important thing to keep in mind here is Make sure that this essay reflects your narrative, reflects your true story and shows an authentic view of you. It should be something that you, you know, feel proud to say accurately represents who you are and who you'd like to, you know, and what you'd like to share with that committee um, in terms of giving them an idea of the personal qualities that you'd bring and what you would bring to the class and the experience. So, um, you know, have, you know, the good thing about starting now is you have some time to really introspect and to really craft, um, craft that narrative. And uh, I'm hoping you can come, you know, come up with and devise something that you're really eager to share um, with the whole committee because you feel like it represents you so accurately. 
Uh, and then the next question is about what tips we have on describing the extracurricular activities uh, where you've had leadership positions. And uh, what I want to stress here is that you don't just get to talk about these on your resume. Uh, they can also be on your application and you can describe what you did on your application. And then on your resume, what I would say is um, give the title and then explain what you did. Use resume language, keep it pretty brief and concise. But if there is something special you did, for example, uh, you fundraised and you, uh, you know, you put on a special, uh, a special event that raised $150,000 for an organization, make that clear on your resume, potentially on your application, put it somewhere. And once again, it could even be something that goes in your main essay if it's something that's really close to you. And it can also go in those short answer questions. Just remember to keep in mind that you don't want to just say what you did. Um, if it's a short answer question in particular, you want to explain how and you want to explain why you feel like you made that difference and what was unique about it. Um, does international work experience? Uh, Silva, do you want to talk about that one? Sure. So, um... With the international work experience, uh, whether it works as an advantage if you come from an overrepresented population, um, with this, I would say that more than you know, international or domestic per se, what matters is um, the impact you've had, the contributions you've made. It doesn't really matter whether you're doing this, um, you know, based near where uh, in uh, India, I believe, or abroad. It's just um, really what you want to highlight here is. Um, you know, how have you contributed your, how have your ideas or your recommendations made a difference or improved an organization? Or how have you, have you been able to do anything that um, others have had trouble achieving or executing on before? Um, what have you, um, in terms of uh, communication or partnership, like how do you set yourself apart? Uh, really, it's, it's all about the impact and the contributions, not so much um, the, the clout or the prestige of a certain role and what that would mean. Um, so I think that if that international opportunity gives you an opportunity to um, show, you know, take on more leadership role or um, really make some weightier impacts or contributions, then certainly that could be an advantage. But in and of itself, um, just because it's international, it might not necessarily be so. I think the admissions committee is more interested in just the depth of the impact, the significance of the contributions. Um, the next question, I've been working in a Fortune 500 company since the past six years. However, due to the pandemic, my promotion got delayed by almost two years. Do I explain this anyway? Sure. So anytime there's something in your, um, your work history or anything in your application that you wish you had the space to clarify, or you want to add context to, I would highly recommend filling out that additional information statement. Right here, you can, first off, uh, keep in mind that these admissions committees, um, Stanford's admissions committee, reads in context. So they understand that within the nature, given the nature of the pandemic in the past couple of years, things are different. Promotion cycles are different. Uh, the whole landscape is different as a result. So there is that understanding that you know, the standard track might not necessarily be followed. But just to you know, cover your bases, I would say that it would be helpful to include an explanation for that in that additional information um, section and talk about, um, use that space to talk about um, how it is you have contributed and though you haven't, um, though you haven't followed you know, what would have been that standard promotion track because it got delayed due to the pandemic, um, explain, um, just really explain why that is. Yeah, and uh, one thing I want to reiterate on that is that uh, that optional explanation or that optional uh, essay really does get used a lot and gets used for a lot of different things. You should not feel afraid if there's a particular circumstance that you want to explain, you think there's context that the admissions committee needs for really anything, that is the place to put it. Um, it's not something where it's a red flag that, uh, that I would say almost gets used more often than it doesn't. It's, you know, maybe it certainly gets used a lot. Uh, the next question was about the interviews, um, who hosts them and what is being assessed from them. And they are uh, invitation only. Um, Stanford 
invites a certain number of people to interview. And once you receive an interview, that means that you are a very strong candidate and they want to learn more information about you. And the interview is conducted by an alumni, uh, historically in person, but now um, I think mostly over Zoom. And it's a pretty comprehensive behavioral interview where they're asking a lot of questions, primarily about work and sometimes about your extracurriculars that start with, tell me about a time when. And what they're looking for is what Silpa mentioned earlier, is they're looking for additional evidence of your demonstrated leadership potential. They're looking for your strategic thinking, they're looking for your initiative. They're looking for how you have been effective at influencing others. They're looking for how you have helped other people succeed. And you can almost think of it as this person is going to write an evaluation of you that is going to complement your letters of recommendation um, and really give that fuller picture, picture of what it is that you have done and what the impact is you've had on the organizations you've been involved with. Um, the next question is about waitlisted applicants. Um, that really depends on a million different circumstances. Uh, it really depends from year to year. It depends on how many students end up accepting the offers. Uh, but people may accept an offer, may not accept an offer, not because they're going to another school, but because they want to work for another year. Uh, it, there's a lot of different factors that go into that. Yes, if you have incredible experience while you are on the wait list, you do have the opportunity to share some of that with Stanford, and that could potentially make a difference in your application. Um, but you can also reapply the following year, and that is one thing I do want to stress is that uh, Stanford is not a one and done. Um, you can apply multiple times. And if you applied one year and have just gotten much stronger work experience in the six to nine months after you applied, then it is worth considering applying again because you're a different, potentially a much stronger candidate this year. Any other questions? Anything else? And if not, then, oh wait, yeah. The request for any last questions. Yes. So uh, just want to say it's been a pleasure um, helping to share a little bit about Stanford uh, with all of you. Um, obviously, we both think it's a great institution and uh, we both work very closely at Fortuna with Stanford Business School applicants and uh, really enjoy working on the Stanford application. So is there anything you want to Thank add? you so much for listening. Um, you know, we love, you know, we love talking about um, the uh, MBA application process and interfacing with prospective uh, 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 applicants. And um, I, yeah, thank you so much for being a part of this session and for all of your um, well thought questions. Sure, there's one last question, which is, should I have a lot of work experience before applying? Okay. And yeah. Rachel? <laughs> well, I was just going to say, um, it's not about the number of years, it's about the quality of your work experience. Uh, you have to have a lot of great work experience, but it's less important uh, how long you've been working. Exactly. And I, I would, um, I would add that, of course, it's when we're, when the admissions committee is looking at impact and demonstrated leadership potential, um, this can be found whether someone is a, you know, a senior in college um, applying for that uh, two-year deferral program, or maybe only has one or two years work experience versus somebody who has 10 plus. Um, really the, the impact and the contributions that's going to be looked at in the context of, you know, how many years of work experience you have. So of course, um, someone with two years work experience isn't going to be measured against the same yardstick as somebody with nine or 10 um, years work experience. The expectations are going to be different. So um, even if you don't have the average number of work, years of work experience, four or five, that shouldn't deter you from applying if your contributions are strong. Okay. Anything else? That's it. All right. Well, thank you so much.